My name is Henry Cole, and I was born on the 17th of February, 1937, to my loving parents, Donald and Elizabeth Cole. Growing up, my house was filled with military honors and awards, not only for my father, but also for my uncle. They both served in the war, and while my father was no longer in the military, my uncle continued before eventually becoming a commanding general in the United States Army. It was no surprise that once the Vietnam War started in 1955, I had no choice but to join the army and fight like my father and uncle once did. Now, with my uncle being who he was, my treatment while being drafted into the military was very different from that of a regular soldier. My training was designed for me to join my uncle's special division, which consisted of a select few with the objective of carrying out under-the-radar missions that wouldn't align with the rules of war. While this may seem uncommon, there were always groups like ours in war. The black operatives and Green Berets are common examples. But numerous groups were also formed to carry out these kinds of operations for the army without drawing any attention to themselves. Soon enough, I was enlisted and introduced to the team of around 20 people I would work with throughout the war. But as time and missions passed, the number depleted until there were about just 13 of us left in the unit. Now, I had seen a few horrible things before coming to war, but nothing compared to the look on my comrade's face as a bullet went through his head right beside me. Most of my comrades explained to me that what we were witnessing during the Vietnam War was far more disturbing than anything they'd ever seen before. Jacob, who was our captain, had fought in several wars, but he explained that what made the Vietnam War so different and terrible for the United States Army was the fact that this war wasn't fought using typical war strategies, and as such, the rules of combat did not apply. We couldn't predict anything they would do and some of the things I saw were worse than horror movies and began to take a toll on my sanity. The enemy would cover themselves in mud and lie still on the ground, waiting for us to walk over them before stabbing men from under and ambushing the rest of the group. Their men would also hide in the trees and poison the lakes and food. In fact, this problem quickly escalated to the point where consuming anything you didn't bring from home was a gamble on your life. Despite this, however, the thought of returning home early never crossed any of our minds, as all I could think about was making my father and uncle proud by serving my country. This was something that bonded soldiers during the war. The need and honor to protect the people back home. Something that gave us pride and reason to continue fighting. For a short period, my team and I didn't get any missions. Because a few months prior, we had been given a major objective to find and kill a single man who had been given the nickname, The Herald. No one knew his real name or what he looked like. But he was called the Herald because the government believed that this man was a threat to the war and the safety of our military. We also believed he was leading a plan that would have catastrophic implications and as such, he was to be hunted down and killed. After months of searching, my uncle received intel that informed us the man we were looking for had been hiding in a part of Vietnamese territory called The Fields. This was a region of vast land that was nicknamed the Fields because throughout the war, the military never attempted to approach that area as tales of Vietnamese demons and curses lingered in the place. Of course, we did not care about the stories, but there was never a need to approach the Fields as the Vietnamese themselves didn't stay there, and so we had no real reason to go there until that day. My uncle called us all into a meeting before we left for the Fields. In the meeting, he explained that the intel revealed the man lived in a small house with a woman and child. The order was to dispose of all three and ensure that only our team and some parts of the government would be aware of his death. For reasons I cannot reveal, we wanted the rest of the military and government to continue to believe the Herald was still alive. I can't tell you I understood why, but I understood my mission, and that was what I was going to do. We were all prepared to leave that night when my uncle called only me back into his tent. I walked in to see him deep in thought with his usual expressionless look plastered on his face. After about a minute of standing there in silence, Uncle Mark offered me a seat before proceeding to say, Look, kiddo, I know you and the boys have to head out, so I'll keep this brief. Your father writes me every day, and I want you to know both him and I are proud of the man you've become. He walked to the corner before bringing out a gas mask from a drawer and saying, You're a soldier now, and I've taught you all I know. But one never stops learning in war, and as your uncle I feel obliged to protect you. So here's the most important lesson for you to survive. He paused before walking towards me and placing the gas mask in my backpack. 
War is the strongest test for a man, and for a man to survive, he must always be prepared for the worst and hope for the best. I looked my uncle in the eyes as my brain raced trying to understand what he meant. The unfazed look on his face remained, but his eyes showed a glimpse of concern, and mine was full of confusion. Throughout the war, the use of lethal gas wasn't in any way common. In fact, it had never been used and only our troops had tried using gas in the beginning of the war. But that failed horribly as the Vietnamese fighters somehow made use of specific leaves to act as gas masks. Despite my confusion, I wasn't in any position to ask questions so as soon as my uncle nodded for me to leave, I stood up with the mask in my bag and left with my team on the mission. Our plan was going exactly as we hoped and my team and I covered ourselves completely with mud and camouflage as we snuck through the fields at around 11 p.m. The path through the fields set the scene so perfectly and it was so dark that we could barely see each other and knew there was no possible way for the enemy to see us coming. The tall trees above us remained still and the grass was so high that we could barely see above it. This was all to our advantage though as we tried our best to match the stillness of the fields as we closed in on the enemy. About 30 minutes later, we approached a small cottage in what seemed like the center of the fields, and from the windows, we could see our target in the house. Jacob, our leader, signaled for us to surround the compound, and despite my years in the military, my heart pounded as I separated from the group to cover the back of the house. Eventually, I found a good spot and positioned myself deeper in the bushes before withdrawing my rifle and checking out the area. This was necessary, but pointless, as I could barely see anything except the light coming from the house. My face was still completely covered in paint and mud as I watched carefully. Mark and Noah approached the door and waited for orders to enter. However, before Jacob could give the signal, I heard glass break and multiple gas canisters flew out of the windows. I quickly looked around to see if anyone knew what was happening, but the confusion was so evident on everyone's face. In that moment, gas began to fill the air and as the suffocating scent of what smelled like mustard hit my nose, I realized we were in trouble. Canisters began to fall from the trees all around us, and men who barely wore any clothes and had their faces covered in mud and leaves began jumping from the tall trees with blades and spears. The Vietnamese fighters always had a native look to them, but these men had what looked like blood mixed in with the mud on their faces. They had red symbols on their bodies, and to this day, I continue to tell people that their eyes were far from normal, and I am completely certain that they were filled with some kind of green liquid. All ten members of my team immediately opened fire, but as the mustard gas started to suffocate people, the scene turned into the most horrific sight I had ever seen in my life. I fell to the floor and struggled to breathe as I slowly retrieved the gas mask from my bag and put it on my face. As the men fell from the trees, it looked like they were coming from the sky, and with their horrific appearance, Mixed with the darkness of the night, it looked like a scene straight out of a horror movie. I held onto my rifle and watched as my comrades began to cough up their insides and bleed from every hole in their bodies. They bled from their ears, eyes, and noses, with some of their bodies even releasing blood from their rear end. John and a few others who were positioned farther away continued to fire shots into the darkness, but only screams filled the dark air and it wasn't long before the enemy cut both their arms before cutting open their torsos and letting their insides fall to the ground. The others who were slowly dying from the gas were left to slowly die in agony as their eyes burst and they screamed for help. In that moment, fear was the only thing I felt and my mind raced as I asked myself, is that was where I was going to die? Instinct, however, did not allow me to be frozen with fear. So I retreated deeper into the bushes and laid still as I prayed no one would find me. My lungs felt like gas was in them and I could barely breathe through the mask, but I had to remain still and hope the calmness of the fields would hide me from the men who fell from the sky. Sadly, I continued to struggle for air and my fight to remain conscious proved useless as barely a minute later, I was laid still in the middle of nowhere, completely unconscious. I woke up a couple of hours later, gasping for air and coughing up blood. The horrific images from the night before immediately filled my mind and I had to cover my mouth trying not to throw up. The large trees above still covered me in darkness, but I could tell no one was around, so I made my way towards my ex-comrades. Till this day, the sight of their organs, bodies and blood on the floor is the most disturbing thing I'd ever seen. 
The faint scent of mustard gas still lingered in the air, and I threw up from the stench and sight of their mutilated bodies. My mind raced as I thought carefully about what my next move would be. If I returned to camp, I would be imprisoned or killed for desertion, even if there was nothing I could have done. A sense of shame filled me, and I felt horrible for not fighting to my last breath, but there was nothing I could do now. So I thought for hours about what to do next before finally coming to a decision. I took out my knife and placed my left arm on a table I found in a house. I knew what I was about to do was risky, but a part of me felt I needed punishment. And this was the only way I could explain surviving the attack. My vision blurred as I took a deep breath and prepared for what I had to do. Understandably, I tried to calm down and simply repeated to myself, breathe, breathe. As I inhaled, it began to cut off my left arm. The unimaginable pain filled my body and I began to cry as blood poured from my arm slowly, then rapidly, before eventually my left arm hit the floor. Jesus Christ, Henry, what happened to you? Where's Jacob and the rest of the men? My uncle said as I struggled back to camp. His usual expressionless face was filled with concern as the medical group rushed to get me first aid. I cried and sat on the floor as my uncle approached me slowly before saying, What happened to your arm? The medical group returned and began to disinfect and bandage the hole where my left arm once was. I cried as I told the group and my uncle about what happened the night before. They were all horrified as I told the story, but thankfully, they didn't ask many questions, and a plane was sent for me later that day. A couple of months later, I was honored and given a medal for my bravery in the war. My parents and uncle attended the ceremony, and while my father tried hiding it, I could tell he was extremely sad about what happened to me and partly blamed himself for letting me leave. My uncle, on the other hand, didn't show much emotion about what happened, and a part of me wonders how and why he gave me a gas mask on the exact day I would need it. Despite all this, however, I never spoke much about that night in Vietnam until this day I lived knowing I was a coward and nightmares of the men falling from the sky with my dead comrades still haunt my dreams. War is a truly horrific thing and to make matters worse, when it was revealed America had lost the war, the Vietnam vets were treated with outright hostility and many people saw them as failures who had brought nothing but shame to their nation. The truth is, only soldiers know the true horrors of war. And believe me when I say, some of these stories are more terrifying than anything your mind can ever imagine. Hope for peace, and pray not for war. Because in the times of war, even the strongest men can lose their minds. This story was shared by an anonymous ex-operative who shared the tale of his horrific experience in notes left to his children. These notes were neither confirmed nor denied by the United States government, but the identity of his uncle and division remains unknown till this day. My grandfather, who passed away a few years ago at the age of 98, used to tell me a lot of stories. Sometimes the stories used to be his own experiences, and sometimes things that happened with people he knew. But all the stories he told me were always true. During World War II, when my grandfather was a young man, he was a British soldier. For tactical reasons, some of the British troops were stationed in a remote village in Switzerland. Although Switzerland didn't participate in both wars, in the Second World War it did allow the troops for the Allied forces to halt on its outskirts. My grandfather was a mere soldier. He, along with his comrades, was hundreds of kilometers away from their home, saving their nation from the cruel Nazi rule. But during their stay in this remote village, surrounded by snow-clad mountains and valleys, 
things weren't all that easy. A few days after they arrived in the town, weird things started to happen. The villagers were kind enough to offer the necessities to the troops, but when supplies started to go missing from the camps, the already tense atmosphere became even more tense. First, things like wooden animal traps, some food, soldiers' gear, and other valuables started going missing. Their commander, who was an experienced soldier, dismissed all of these things and never truly investigated the thefts. He thought the soldiers had larger matters at hand rather than investigating such petty thefts. He asked all of the troops to be more vigilant and to take care of their things, but soon their stay, which was going to last for a couple of days, turned to weeks and then months. Every night, when soldiers went into the forest to relieve themselves, some of them reported seeing a creature that was nine foot tall and looked like a humanoid lurking in the forest. Once again, the commander dismissed all such claims and said that homesickness was playing tricks on the minds of the soldiers and that they needed to focus on the task at hand. But one evening, a woman from the village came running into their camp. She was screaming and crying and yelling. When their commander spoke to her, she said that her daughter had went missing, and she blamed the troops for it. Her daughter was around seven years old, and she had wandered in their camp's direction alone. But before any of her family members could get her, she was gone. The entire unit started looking for the girl in the dead of night. Many of my grandfather's comrades went into the forest to look for the girl. They started their search at night as soon as the woman had entered their campsite crying. They searched all night until the sun was above their head on the next day, but the girl wasn't found. Their commander had finally taken this seriously, and he too was actively looking for the lost child. The next day passed and the girl wasn't found. Many troops who were very religious started talking about the figure they had seen in the forest, and soon the whole camp was talking about the monster. Their commander was the only one who didn't believe in the sightings of a monster. A couple more days had passed and no one had recovered from the shock of the missing girl. Then, another boy around the same age went missing. But he was last seen on the other side of the village, very far away from their camp, so at least this time the troops weren't blamed. Anyway, all the soldiers again began to search for the missing child. They searched for two days straight this time, determined to find the kid, but to no avail. The little boy was lost forever. Everyone was on high alert, be it the soldiers or the villagers. Parents were afraid to send their kids anywhere, especially after the sun was down, and once again the talk of a monster gained popularity. By now the threat of the Nazis and the two missing kids was enough to break the commander's morale, and he too thought that there was perhaps an unknown entity abducting the kids. But in the back of his mind, he was suspicious of a hidden Nazi platoon that might be abducting kids to scare or perhaps distract the British troops stationed in the village. By then, the troops wanted to leave the village, and the villagers wanted them gone for good, too. The stress of an impending attack was hovering above their head, and the missing kids were a tough thing to deal with, too. But until they got any further orders, they couldn't leave the village. Two more weeks passed, and three more kids disappeared in that time. All hell had broken loose, and the villagers were now full-on accusing the soldiers, and the troops had no idea what to do. The soldiers were 100% sure that there was an entity that was preying on the kids in the village. One week later, a private named John Clarkson, who went to look into the forest that night, had also gone missing. This proved that the soldiers weren't behind these incidents. So one night, a small group of soldiers armed from head to toe, led by the commander, went into the forest to hunt the true perpetrator. My grandfather was a part of that group. When they were deep into the mountains, they spotted a lone figure. It appeared like the monster the soldiers back in the camp had described. The moment they spotted it, they began chasing after it with their guns ready. They must have chased this entity for at least an hour uphill. It was fast, but these guys were more in number, so at least one of them had an eye on him. Finally, it went inside a cave situated in the mountains. The terrain there was very rough, and there was light snow all around them. The mouth of the cave was very narrow, and they could only see darkness from the inside. But before the commander and his men could decide their further actions, shots were fired from inside the cave, 
and so these men were forced to fire back. After about 15 minutes of continuous firing, no bullets were coming out of the cave. The troops waited for another few minutes and finally entered. When they went into the small cave, the things they saw were horrific. My grandfather told us that what he saw in that cave still gives him nightmares. There on the floor of the cave was the private who had gone missing. His gun was lying beside him, and he was shot through the head. He was dead. However, that was the least mortifying sight in the cave. Around him were the bodies of all the kids who had gone missing. All the kids were half-eaten and left to rot. My grandfather rushed out of the cave and puked. Many other men in the small group couldn't hold their dinners inside either. When they returned to the camp, they informed the villagers of their findings. Everyone was devastated. No one had a clue what was going on. Was Private John Clarkson kidnapping the kids and keeping them in the cave? If he was doing that, then what did my grandfather and his group see in the forest? What or who was that tall entity they chased after? Was it their mind playing tricks on them? Or was the private, along with the kids, a victim of the entity? Until today, this incident hasn't been made very public, and no one knows what went on in that forest all those years back. What do you guys think? Who or what is the real culprit? <laughs>